on the Deja Vu series. I am so honored to have with me Dr. Robert Floyd. We have been getting to know each other and we have so much in common, but I am prepared to learn today right along with all of you. Oh, Dr. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to meet with me. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. This has been, I've had, I got to say, I've just enjoyed the last hour that we've spoke. Uh, it's it's like we're we're brothers and sisters from another mother. So thank you so much. And, and what you're doing absolutely is wonderful and the world needs it. So thank, thank you. you. I do feel that we're kindred spirits. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you're going to share today how our mitochondria is the miracle. And you've already shared a little bit with me that I knew nothing about. So as we're setting our New Year's resolutions and people are focused on optimal health or weight loss, what does their mitochondria have to do with that? Well, I can tell you that, um, you know, mitochondria are absolutely some of the most vital cellular components that we have, right? And most people don't even know what mitochondria is. You might have learned about it back in, you know, eighth grade biology, but we all remember, or we all learned at one point um, that mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They generate ATP, okay? ATP is the currency of energy that gives us energy um, as human beings, as, you know, any mammals. Um, you have to generate ATP to make cellular energy. And so uh, mitochondria are what generate ATP. Um, one of the cool things about ATP is that this is, a, this is a cool fact. It's estimated that we make our own body weight every day in ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's three, it's a, it's a um, amino acid in, with three phosphates. And, and, and those are micro molecular size structures, right? And we make our entire body weight of it every day. And that's how important ATP is. So um, when you don't make ATP, you're going to have chronic fatigue. You're going to have um, autoimmune disease. You're going to just feel terrible. And ATP, again, it's, it's, it's the energy currency of our cells. That's fascinating. So I'm making enough ATP equivalent to my body weight every day. That would require a lot of energy, it seems. Absolutely, 100%. And the energy that you're getting, let's, let's step back one real quick. Food is information for every one of the 70 trillion cells in our body, right? And that, what happens is food gets broken down and then food particles, it gets broken down in the, uh, the chemical structures of what actually makes food. Those then go into the mitochondria. And what's cool, mitochondria are so special that, um, you know, we have um, quadrillions of mitochondria in our body. That's thousands of trillions of mitochondria. And these little mitochondria, uh, they're very, very special. I'll, I'll go back over that in a minute. But what I want to say is that my, the, the more people, like if they look at back in cellular biology back in like eighth grade again, or, you know, freshman year in high school biology, like they look at a cell and maybe there's one little mitochondria and there's lysosomes and there's endoplasmic reticulum. And then there's the nucleus with DNA in it. And everybody, it seems like, oh, there's one mitochondria per cell. That's not true at all. There are literally thousands of trillions of mitochondria in your body. And the more bioactive a tissue is, like let's say your heart, the more mitochondria there are in the heart cells, okay? Or let's say in your skin, the skin's not very, you know, it's not really active. It's not metabolically active. Your liver cells are metabolically active. Your brain cells are metabolically active. Your kidneys are metabolically active. So for in those tissues, that one cell might have 10,000 mitochondria in the heart cell, right? And because you need to, they need to make energy, ATP, 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 ATP. They need to keep making energy. And so again, food is information for those mitochondria. And when you're feeding yourself low quality, ultra processed food, it's not getting the information it needs to go down the specific biochemical pathways to make enough ATP. So we need energy to make energy. Yes, 100%. So, we, so where the energy comes from then would be food from real whole food, which then gets transferred into ATP into our mitochondria. Correct. Yep. Correct. Correct. 
Yeah, pretty much for the most part. So the energy really, the, the first place the energy comes from is the sun, right? Into uh, plants. Animals eat those plants, we eat those animals, but it all came from the sun. And, or we eat those plants, those plants are then break, being broken down and giving us energy from the sun, which is a, it's a, it's a cool system when you look at it. And so, you know, um, there's, they also, the mitochondria, they don't just make energy, but they also make um, other molecules that are responsible for um, keeping our cells clear and clean and running clean. You can, I, I love the idea of equating a mitochondria to the engine in your car, right? Your car is the cell. And without the engine, your car is not going anywhere, right? So the mitochondria is the engine, but the engine in your car needs a substrate to go into it. That's gasoline and oxygen. Okay. They burn together. It gives your car energy and you drive to the store or wherever you're driving. The mitochondria is very, very similar to that. <clears throat> it needs the substrate, which is, it can be fatty acids. It can be pyruvate. This is all biochemistry stuff. Those go into the, into the mitochondria. They get broken down. What's the, the, the Krebs cycle and out of it becomes ATP out of it comes at the other end ATP. But right. just like the motor in your car, when it's functioning and burning gas and burning oxygen together out of the exhaust comes exhaust. And they're there. That same thing happens with your mitochondria because in order to break things down, they have byproducts and those byproducts are called reacts reactive oxidant species oxidants right and everybody on this show has heard antioxidants oh let's take these antioxidants they're good for you right and so what happens is antioxidants just like i said like the, your car makes exhaust your mitochondria makes exhaust inside the cells and it's called the ros reactive oxidant species so your body has to go in and make these antioxidants and your body the human body is genius i think it's the most genius thing in the universe that we know of. Okay. Uh, and so um, the mitochondria also make uh, lots of molecules to oftentimes help get rid of those reactive oxygen species, oxygen species, and other molecules to keep the cells running well. So it's really, really a fascinating uh, biochemical structure. So I'm glad you brought up that our energy comes from the sun because we have talked on this event about whole foods <clears throat> and the damage from processed foods, but I don't think we've really made the correlation, at least not um, on this event, that whole foods have sunlight photosynthesis. We're actually getting the energy from real food from the sun. Um, you know, when you say this, I start thinking about the kids who are all eating a diet, mostly processed foods and why they're all so low energy. They don't go outside and play anymore. <laughs> um, we've definitely seen a big change in this next generation, haven't we? Yeah, it's very, 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 very sad. And like we were talking earlier, you know, you know, there's a really startling statistic. There was um, an article in the American College of Cardiology uh, of this summer, 22, that said, 93.2% uh, of all American adults are metabolically unwell. Okay, so if you break that down statistically, and you, you're, a, you're a, a business person, you know about statistics, you can literally say the entire American adult population is sick. Right. And so what you and I were talking about before earlier is that like, and you know, this is one of the reasons I do what I do with my program, because I tell my clients, I say, listen, you know, you're 50 years old and you have diabetes and autoimmune disease and maybe high blood pressure. Your child is 14 and they are going to have adult diseases before they hit 20. And so it does go back to what we're talking about, the food. And the, again, food is information for every one of your cells. If you eat whole foods, sorry, the sun's coming in. Yeah, sun's setting. Whole, whole <laughs> foods, you are getting um, the energy from the sun, you're getting the energy from the micronutrients in the soil. Um, and that is feeding your cells that is feeding your mitochondria. Okay. When you eat these highly processed foods, it's, it's like, again, going back to the, the car motor, 
if you put sugar in your gas tank instead of gasoline, it's not going to run well. It's going to pop and, and smoke, and then it's probably going to break down. And it's the same thing when you're doing that, when you're putting garbage food into your cells. And you know when you eat a highly processed food diet, what happens is that it kind of gums up the mitochondria. And instead of being efficient and giving you ATP out the other end, they might give you, a, instead of you know 47 ATP for this molecule, they're only going to give you 12. And then you're going to be in an energy deficit. And by the way, you're going to have more inflammation and more of those ROS, reactive oxygen species, causing more inflammation. And then your cells are going to get sick. It's all down to the cellular level of what we're talking about. Yes. What <clears> else <throat> can we do? Aren't there things that we can do to increase our energy production or heal our mitochondria in addition to food? And what I'm thinking of is I had studied sauna therapy and um and started doing cold plunges sauna therapy followed by cold plunges years ago um now now i study wim hof but even prior to that and i thought that was for uh energy production does that have any impact absolutely absolutely it uh what it does is it's what doesn't kill you makes you stronger okay and that goes at the cellular level as well right it's called hormesis right uh Okay, so we can go with uh, lifting weights, right? When you lift weights, what you do is you're breaking down your muscles. Your body, again, genius, knows how to rebuild that muscle bigger and stronger. And that's, especially if you feed it what it needs to rebuild it bigger and stronger. Yes, um, you know, stress, uh, environmental stressors like that are not poisonous and such as saunas um, and cold plunges, they release things from your liver called heat shock proteins. And these heat shock proteins tell your body, hey, there's a stress. We need to be stronger. They make more mitochondria. Um, another thing that's really, really great for uh, mitochondria enhancement is high intensity interval training. Um, again, it's going back down to breaking down the muscles to rebuild them. You know, again, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, literally. And it is true. Uh, one of the things that I I love and I institute in my program. Uh, is, and I've been doing this myself for four or five years now, is time-restricted feeding, intermittent fasting. So I get my clients to uh, do time-restricted feeding on a 16 and 8 schedule. So you fast for 16 hours every day and you eat all of your calories. I have to rephrase, I repeat that, all of your calories in that eight-hour window. Because I've had clients say, oh, well, I've just eat one meal in that eight-hour window. That's not okay. That's not enough. You have to eat all your calories in that eight hour window. And what they found is that fasting um, causes what's called autophagy, which is the destruction of senescent cells. Senescent cells are old people cells. Like just that, like, as, as people get older in society, they don't work as much. They're not as efficient. They get sicker and they end up dying. So a senescent cell is an old cell, kind of they've been called zombie cells. They're not working well. The All the little... Um, cellular products inside maybe are not working well. Your mitochondria are not working well. And when you fast, you trigger uh, chemical processes to cause autophagy, which is the destruction of those poorly working cells, maybe recycle any of the good parts in it and throw the bad parts out, and then you make more cells. And the same thing goes with fasting and mitophagy, which is cool. You actually, when you fast, you kill off some of the less efficient uh, mitochondria. Therefore, it also makes mitogenesis, which is the new product, the production of new mitochondrial cells. And those new mitochondrial cells are way, way better, more efficient and give you more energy. And they work really, really well. So, you know, like you said, um, hormetic stressors like sauna, cold plunges, uh, high, intensive, high intensity interval training, fasting, um, and all those can really help increase your mitochondria and therefore give you more energy. And I, I found that a lot of my clients, they say, wow, I thought when I started fasting, I'd be really lethargic and not feeling good. And they're like, I can't believe how much energy I have. And so it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I discovered that for myself only because my eating was out of control. I was a carbohydrate addict and I always knew I never felt good when I ate breakfast. When I ate breakfast, I was hungry all day. 
And so I'm like, I just have to stop. I have to stop eating breakfast. I don't feel good when I eat breakfast. Do you know, I, in my research, I found a book back to 1888 called the starvation diet for diabetes. Now I had type two diabetes. I was told to eat more frequently. <laughs> yes. I have to laugh about some of these misnomers, right? Because I hear this still from people. Well, I was told to eat more frequently and I'm like, you don't have to eat more frequently, but you need to find what works for you. But that starvation book for diabetes was interesting. We can get into the good and the bad because they tested that on both type one and type two diabetes. And that does not work for type one. No, no, um, no. But, you know, a, a $20 glucose meter will actually show you that like uh, a 16, eight or whatever your, your eating window is, you can test it with a glucose monitor. And when I stick to a 16, eight, my, my glucose levels are much better. When I eat past 6 PM, my fasting glucose in the morning is high. It'll be over a hundred. Yeah. Like 111. And, and it just because I ate past 6 PM, of course, if I eat carbs, that's worse, but it even just eating late for me affects my blood glucose. And it's funny because, you know, 111 doesn't sound that high, but it is high. And so, but, you know, I mean, you could have a glucose of, you know, after you eat a big fat meal, you could have a glucose of, you know, 180, 200. Um, but yeah, fasting has been, there's, there's a reason that all major world religions have fasting holidays and, and fasting times of the year. Um, you know, it's, Maybe it's something, you know, that they just knew deep in our DNA that fasting is good for you. And, you know, as humans, we're not supposed to be full all the time. And I I love fasting. I get way more energy from fasting. I mean, I I even train jujitsu while I'm fasting. Like, and, and people are like, oh my God, how do you do that? I'm like, I don't notice a difference anymore. Um, I, I ride my dirt bike when I'm fasting. Um, I mean, I'm fasting. Oh, not today. Actually, my wife made me some breakfast, but most days I like, 90% of the time I fast every day. I don't eat till about two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, it's been proven that when you are in a fasted state, it actually does help your mitochondria uh, work more efficiently as well. And one of the things that, you know, going back to the fasting and diabetes is that um, the standard American diet is just full of carbohydrates. And what happens is your brain doesn't ever learn how to use the ketones, which is the breakdown of fatty acids for energy. And, you know, uh, Dr. Perlmutter uh, is a, a great uh, brain doctor and uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, another guy, if uh, your, your clients are, if they know anybody with some dementia or anything like that, look up those two doctors, but they both talk about how fasting gives your brain a resilience it, what it does is it take, teaches your brain to say, okay, I don't have carbs to use. I'm going to use ketones and, and I can use all the ketones I can in my body. It's a breakdown of fatty acids for energy for the brain. And it's always very, very good to do that, to, to kind of like train your brain to get into that fasting state. So I remember when I went to Keto Academy, I heard from Dr. Mary Newport. Newport. She wrote a book her husband had has Alzheimer's, but she can get his symptoms to subside when he's in a ketogenic state. She oh, said they sure. literally carry MCT oil wherever they go. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I've heard about too the, um, you know, while we're talking about oils, you know, MCT oils are, they're easily burned in um, the mitochondria. Again, if you're brain it's much more metabolically active it has a lot more mitochondria so when you are eating a crappy standard american diet full of highly processed foods um you know calorie dense nutrition um starved foods the more metabolically active cells your heart and your brain your kidneys they have problems with because their mitochondria are gummed up and so when you do eat you know, I've also heard about like people with, um, you know, dementia as well, like coconut oil, you know, feed them a tablespoon of coconut oil every day. I've heard like, this is anecdotally recently, two or three people told myself and my wife about people that they knew who were experiencing some signs of dementia and they were given coconut oil and it just, it doesn't get rid of it. Of course not, but it helps it. Like you said, your friend does too as yeah. well. So, you know, the mitochondria are 
They're absolutely vital to your cells. And I'll tell you, there's a couple, we talked about this a little bit before, that's very interesting things that most people don't even know that um, the mitochondria, they originated from a very unusual source. The, the, they're descendants of ancient bacteria. And actually, the mitochondria in your body, the DNA is not your DNA. It's actually That's crazy to me. I've never heard this before. This is crazy. Yeah. to me. <laughs> so way, way back when in evolution, we figured out how to hijack these little cells into our cells to give us more energy because it, you know, again, the gene body is genius. Um, we said these little cells are super efficient at making energy. And so we hijacked them. And now we have all these mitochondrial cells in our cells. And what's cool about it and is because their DNA is not from ours, it's not, it's bacterial DNA. The mitochondria has a, you know, every cell has a lipid bilayer around it. It's two layers of lipids and they, 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 they're very fl uh, flexible, pliable, malleable, you know, they can squish and this and that. And when they get, when the cell walls get damaged, that's when cellular damage happens. But inside the cell is your mitochondria it has a lipid bilayer on the outside of it, but then it has a whole nother um, membrane inside it, which keeps that DNA in doubly uh, protected from being let out into our cells. And this is something I learned a while back and uh, doing a lot of research on the mitochondria because I'm pretty fascinated by them. They're actually finding that when people with autoimmune disease are fine, we're finding mitochondrial dna in the serum in the plasma plasma in the blood if you have uh, rheumatoid arthritis they're finding mitochondrial dna in the joint space so because this mitochondrial dna is not yours your body sees it in there and starts attacking it and your immune system is going on overdrive and this is so how did it get issues. out it was protected in that cell how did it get out from eating the standard american diet <laughs> from eating too many carbs and not eating well, eating highly processed foods. Um, again, you know, food is information, right? So just look at the, the astronomical rise in autoimmune disease over the last 50 years. Um, you know, a thousand years ago, did autoimmune disease even exist? No. I doubt it. No. You know, here's here's the thing that baffles me is that you know, okay, so and, and it doesn't matter if you believe in, you know, creation from God or evolution. Over the last 500 to 750,000 years, we as human homo sapiens have been evolving. Every generation, we're getting bigger, better, faster, stronger, smarter, living just a little bit longer than the one before. We did that for 500,000 years. I don't know if that's going to hold true <laughs> going forward. Well, what's happened in the last 50 years oh wait all of a sudden the entire american adult population is sick yeah what's happened in the last 50 years highly processed foods okay um and then again you know um uh, i'm a big big there's i'm a big proponent of avoiding seed oils at this time which i just started learning about not too long ago Seed oils are really hijacking our mitochondria and they're damaging our mitochondria because they cannot be used as energy as well for mitochondria. Seed oils are toxic to us. And, you know, I, I might catch some grief from this because, oh, oh, you're just trying to be, you know, an extremist. And, you know, if you get 10 doctors in a room, you're going to have 14 different opinions, right? But seed oils, um, I will tell you, they used to be considered toxic waste. Before oil was found to be able to use for heating in our homes and light in our homes, we used to use cottonseed oil for heating and light, okay? And so what happened was then the, they discovered oil and kerosene and things like that, and you could heat your house with it, and you could have oil lamps in your house. And guess what? Cottonseed oil then was described as a toxic waste product okay so then <clears throat> procter and gamble there i mean <laughs> uh, they're they, they're some, they were two very smart people they did a lot they invented a lot of cool stuff but what they did was they took seed oil this this cotton seed oil 
and they started using it for soap and they were making soap out of it. And then one day they decided, hey, you know what? Maybe we can hydrogenate this chemically. We'll make it look like seed oil in room temperature is a liquid. If you hydrogenate it, it becomes a solid like lard. And so all of a sudden, Procter & Gamble, they came across this new technology to make cooking oil that mimic lard and tallow out of toxic waste cottonseed oil. And then actually, if you read a little bit deeper in this, you'll know, because I, I, I've been reading this, that they actually then donated a bunch of money to the American Heart Association <laughs> in order Big to- trans fat was good for us. Yeah. <laughs> to say that, hey, this is good for us. This is good for us. This is good for us. Just like high fructose corn syrup, it's just corn. Yeah, that's that's the biggest lie in the world. It is not just corn. Um, again, that's another thing I've, that really gums up your mitochondria is high fructose corn syrup. And so what happens is when you eat high fructose corn syrup, I'm telling everybody right now, <laughs> read your labels, stop eating high fructose corn syrup. It is literally almost as poisonous as alcohol for your cells. What happens is high fructose corn syrup goes into your cells and fructose can only be broken down by your liver, okay? And so people look at, um, you know, um, cholesterol panels right now. Everybody's, if you eat a whole bunch of high fructose corn syrup, your triglycerides are gonna be through the roof. And that's what happened to you. Your triglycerides were through the roof because you were eating tons and tons of carbs. But so the problem with high fructose corn syrup is that it comes into the cell. It, it doesn't trigger insulin. It doesn't need insulin. It takes more ATP that we spoke about earlier, which is the energy. It takes more ATP to break it down. And then the biochemical pathways that try to rejuvenate that ATP lead to an increased production of uric acid. Okay. And then uric acid, everybody knows uric acid causes gout, right? And actually there's a lot of studies now. There's a Dr. David Perlmutter, he just came out with a book called Drop Acid to, about lowering uric acid. Even back, I want to say is maybe like 30 or 40 years ago, it might've been in the fifties actually, they did studies that show that uric acid causes high blood pressure. And then they gave people allopurinol, which blocks uric acid and people's blood pressure went down. And the reason why high fructose corn syrup goes in, depletes ATP, goes into uric acid, uric acid then blocks a chemical, an enzyme in your body called nitric oxide synthase. And nitric oxide is really good for us, right? It, what it does, it's a vasodilator. It relaxes the blood vessels. So when uric acid blocks um, nitri uh, nitric oxide synthase, you don't have enough nitric oxide, which is a, 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 a muscle relaxer and a smooth muscles about all your blood vessels. Guess what that does? Leads to high blood pressure. It raises your blood pressure, right? Exactly. So just eating high fructose corn syrup raises your blood pressure, lowers wow. your ATP energy and raises your triglycerides and it makes you fat. And basically what that does, that right there, oh, and also decreases your insulin sensitivity, increases insulin resistance. So that right there gives you metabolic syndrome by definition. And that's what I was talking about. 93.2% of all Americans right now, according to the American College of Cardiology, are metabolically ill. They have metabolic syndrome. And I mean, to me, that's just, it's just, it's so, so sad because, you know, we have to change this. We cannot, we have devolved in 50 years, going back to the 500 to 700,000 years. We've done all this in 50 years. And we cannot continue this way. And to me, this is why I do what I do with my paleo MD and my leaky gut solution program, because I don't want to see this continue. Um, you know, you and I were talking about what's going to happen when people can't work. Yep. You know, how we're, we're going to be financially doomed. If you can't go to work, how are you going to live? You know, <laughs> I can't pay for you. <laughs> well, don't you think it's ironic that there's a new TV show called The Good Doctor where he's autistic? Like we're being primed for all of these autistic kids because what does the future look like when we're not <clears throat> fixing the root cause and we have more and more kids 
Dr. Zach Bush says 54% of all kids are in a disease process. I mean, that that's a travesty. This makes me weep. I don't, I don't know how we can allow, you just gave the best explanation I ever heard on what high fructose corn syrup does to us and why we all have fatty liver now. I mean, there's a huge percentage of people with fatty liver who don't drink alcohol. And, Absolutely. and do you know, um, <laughs> I have a friend, her doctor told her, you have fatty liver, you need to stop eating all fat. And I was like, <laughs> a doctor needs to go back to learn biochemistry again. So, uh, you know, <laughs> Two, two things that you just brought up. One is autism. They um, basically most chronic disease, I believe, is from mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, and there's actually some studies out there that autism may be from dysfunctional mitochondria. There's also another study that I heard that by right now, I mean, autism used to be one in fifty thousand males, and then it was one in twenty thousand males, and then it was one in one hundred thirty-two males. I heard a startling statistic that by 2030, every male born in America will have autism. Yeah, I've heard one in six at a minimum or one in six by 2025. I don't know, it's what- That's one not in acceptable. It is not I, acceptable I and it's preventable. Yep. It's, it's preventable except for the problem is that there's too much money to be had by big food, big pharma, big insurance, and big medicine, right? They make money when we're sick. They love it. They don't care about us. But what I can't understand is how do these people in these giant corporations sleep at night? Because they have kids too, right? They have grandchildren too, right? It's going to affect them just as it's affecting us. They're not going to be immune to these problems. And I mean, you know, I literally sometimes come to tears thinking about this. And I know <laughs> that seems silly, but it's just so sad. Um, you talked about fatty liver disease. Okay. There are 90 million people in America. There's 310 million people in America right now. There are 90 million people in America with fatty liver disease, and it's called non alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, NAFLD. Okay. That's from our diet alone, 100% from our high carbohydrate diet. So, the scary thing about that is the next step from that, and I have seen this in the hospitals over and over and over and over. The next step from fatty liver disease, not from NAFLD is NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And so high fructose corn syrup causes that too. So you have NAFLD. If you reverse things, it goes away. If you keep doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, the next step is NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And the scariest thing from that, the next step from that is liver failure. We are looking at an epidemic of liver failure. And when I say 90 million people in America have NAFLD, that includes children, yeah. okay? And these children don't deserve this, okay? We talked about this before. Um, the injustice that's being perpetrated upon us in the name of corporate greed, yeah. it, it sickens me. And I did some research on the foods that are served in the schools and there's kickbacks from all of those corporations, you know, so the, the foods, the brands that are sold in the schools, they provide <clears throat> the schools incentives. And, um, so basically our schools were, were bought off and, mm -hmm. um, and people are still of the belief that if it's sold in the grocery store, it must not be too bad. Or if they serve it in the school, it must not be too bad. And I think one of the things that we're imploring people to do is to stop with the blind faith and stop buying into the marketing messages and take personal responsibility. I mean, that's that's what this is all about. The reason you're stuck, the reason that we set the same New Year's resolutions over and over is because we're not getting to the root cause. And you did such a great job explaining. I'm I love this explanation of high fructose corn syrup. I try to tell people how bad it is, but I never understood what it actually did in our body. Um, and the energy production, this this right here is a key, everyone. Um, for those of you listening, you're setting your news resolutions, you want optimal health for you and your family, then focus on what you're putting into your bodies to help produce energy, which 
that's just amazing to me. Everything about mitochondria. I think I have a lot more to learn in that area. Um, yeah. But it starts, if we keep it simple, it starts with food. Food that had sunlight. Yeah, again, food is information for every one of the 70 trillion cells in your genius body. Treat your body like a temple. Okay, and okay, I, I'm... My program is not dogma. We're all humans. We all have to eat a Snickers bar every now and then or a piece of cake at a party or a cookie or a donut. <laughs> One of the things I implore my clients to do is make it a habit not to have it. And that is important. Make it a habit not to be eating cookies every day. Make it a habit not to eat pizza four times a week. Make it a habit to not eat ice cream. Again, I'm not telling you to become an ascetic and just forego everything because that would be that would be a crappy life. I'm not perfect. One of the big things about the paleo diet and paleo MD is it's not dogma. And I tell my clients this a lot. Just because I'm telling you to go gluten-free, dairy-free, and sugar-free for this first three months doesn't mean you can't ever eat them again for the rest of your life, right? And so, but if you make things make it a habit not to have the bad things, then you can have more resilience when you do eat something that's not healthy for you. So I'll tell you, when I have people go through my program, three months, we take away those high inflammatory foods to rest the digestive system, to detox, to do some cleansing, heal the gut lining. And then I would say in month three, you can add, you're going to add back whatever you want, one thing at a time, because then they feel in their body how that ingredient makes them feel. So it's not me telling them you can never have this again. They'll go to add some of those things back and they'll say, oh my God, I didn't even realize how good I felt. I feel terrible now that I ate that. Yep. Now, Absolutely. now they have like, um, you know, a baseline, right? Like I know how I can feel. I know how this makes me feel. Now, at least I'm making a conscious choice when I want to eat that. I know how it's going to make me feel. This is what I'm doing now with the kids in my cooking program. And when, as soon as you said that, I like started to cry because I, I tell the kids, you can, you can have Snickers, but you have to make them. So we make a healthy Snickers bar with date paste. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> They're, they are amazing. Um, they make their own pizza and their pizza does not have high fructose corn syrup. It does not have, we don't add sugar to our pizza sauce. There's no red dye. There's no. And I show them all the ingredients and I'm like, did we have to add food dye? Did we have to add MSG? No. Why did they add it? You don't need it. And slowly but surely, I have kids in my program that are like, my pie is yellow enough. I, don't, I didn't need to add yellow food dye to my lemon meringue pie. Why do they do that? They're questioning it. They're saying the food companies just put that in to sell us more. So I, I think this is where it has to start is we have to start with the kids and we have to continue to get this information out because we have a choice. We don't have to buy it. hundred percent. You don't, <laughs> we got to stop eating the BS we're being fed. Yeah. You know, and that's, um, that goes for everything. Um, the, the food, the, uh, big tech, the big media, uh, big health, big insurance, you know, go back to let's 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 take it back a couple of steps and go back to like, hey, go outside and play. I mean, you know, I, I wrote an article one time for a health magazine. Do what grandma told you. Right. <laughs> go out and exercise, eat your veggies and don't smoke. You'll be OK. Right. <laughs> and so what one of the last things I can leave with for your clients, um, people watching this is. If you really just need to, the easiest thing for you to do for this year's New Year's resolution, read food labels. If it has high fructose corn syrup in it, don't buy it. Simple. That's it. Try to buy happy, healthy, whole foods. You know, eat more spinach, eat more broccoli, eat more kale, eat squash, eat, you know, and and learn, have fun learning how to cook. I mean, I'm so, I'm so blessed. My wife and I, we cook together every night almost, and we love it. It's a, you know, again, food is med medicine, but it's also community. It's yeah. also joy. It's also bonding. Um, I mean, 
that's I love the whole functional medicine idea of food. It's it's all of those things. It, it it's you know what it is else. It's memories of your childhood, you know. But unfortunately, food has become poison. So it's up to you as your own individual to take agency over your health and have hope and know that just reading food labels and you can change it just by changing your food and don't buy the BS that Procter and Gamble is selling you or Nestle's is selling you or Quaker Oats. Spend a little bit of time reading labels. If it has high fructose corn syrup, don't eat it. If it has seed oils in it and that's canola oil, corn oil, soy oil, uh, um, sunflower seed oil. If it has high fructose corn syrup and seed oils, put it back on the shelf and get something else. And that would be the easiest thing to help improve your health immediately. So Yes, that sums it up really well. I know I have so much more to learn from you and I'm hoping that this is the first of many conversations. Me too. <laughs> this Me too. Been this has been wonderful. I've, I've, I've absolutely enjoyed. It. We've spent two hours together now. It's been amazing. <laughs> it's been so much fun, and I'm 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 blessed to have gotten to know you, and to be a part of what you're doing. And I just want to say thank you again for what you're doing. I appreciate that, Dr. Robert Floyd from Paleo MD. All of his links will be available to you guys in the email and on the videos. Please reach out. He has a program he's putting together. We're all here on this event to provide you the support and resources that you need. If you know someone who's looking to change their life, don't go to your neighbor, your sister, your mother, and assume that what worked for them is going to work for you. Everyone on this summit is here providing support and resources to help you find the answers for your family. And until next time, farewell. Wow.